I'm going to tell you the story about Ray Wood. And uh, it's a happier story. You've heard a lot about wars up until now. And so fortunately for my dad, it did not involve war. He enlisted in the Coast Guard in 1945. He chose the Coast Guard hoping that it would be a, a service that might be a little further from the front than some of the other services. And he always was fascinated with the ocean, so he thought it would be um, kind of a romantic way of getting in the military. But shortly after he enlisted, however, the war was over. Uh, and he, while he was in, in a sense, boot camp, he was in the crowd in Times, Times Square, famous photo of the, of the sailor kissing the woman. He was in Times Square. It wasn't him, but he was in Times Square. <laughs> um, and shortly thereafter, he was asked to either um, leave the Coast Guard, they didn't need enlisted people anymore, or to go to the Coast Guard Academy. He, has, he had been taking some courses to test it very well, and they thought he would be a good candidate. Of course, he chose that one. So he enlisted, uh, uh, he became a, can a cadet at the Academy in the summer of 19. 46, um, where he then spent four years at the academy. Um, one of the unique things about his experience there, he was the first class of cadets that went out and served on the, U the USS Eagle, which, as you know, was uh, received from the Germans as reparations at the end of World War II. And the Coast Guard took it as a sailing craft and to teach their cadets um, you know, all about sailing and, not, and navigation and so forth. And he was really in that first group of young people to sail on that ship that summer, which is fun because many times we visited the Eagle since, including last summer, we went and visited the Eagle when it came to Portsmouth, and we were greeted quite nicely. A mom came with us, and the captain of that ship uh, was gracious enough to give us a nice tour. And we gave him a picture that we recently found of my dad um, on deck, the Eagle pulling sails up in black and white, and the captain was thrilled to see it because you could see the way it was rigged back then. We hadn't had many pictures of that. Mm. Um, and he saved that, went off, sent that off into the Eagle Archives and also posted on the alumni magazine for us. Um, so he graduated in 1950. And uh, he, he first taught at the academy. And then they shipped him off to some ships in Maine. That's why Maine became our home state. Um, he went out on ice patrol. For those of you who don't know what ice patrol is, uh, back before satellites, um, the Coast Guard was, they would go out on these missions in the North Atlantic and they would plot the movement of icebergs so that ships coming across, passenger and cargo, would not ha have happened to them, what happened to the Titanic. And they would map all of these icebergs. One of his trips, he was in Life Magazine, did a story, and there's pictures of him in Life Magazine with giant icebergs next to the ships. Uh, one of the stories he told that was really kind of interesting is uh, they had, first of all, he talked about two things, to me at least that I remember. One is going out in the middle of wintertime, North Atlantic. You can't imagine how cold it was and how the ship was completely covered with ice. So if they went outside the ship, you know, they had to be tethered on, they had warm clothing. Uh, Sometimes the waves were 40 to 50 feet high, ship very small, um, and just coated with ice. I can't imagine what that would have been like. The second story was, was that his signalman that was on board with him, they used to, back in those days, it wasn't like cell phones today. Um, they would get radio transmissions, yeah. often in Morse code, did did da did did da And they had a signalman on their ship who could take two messages at once. He had two typewriters, and he could bring, his brain was wired, so he could type out one message on one typewriter hearing mm. one signal, and he could hear another signal coming in this one and type out a, a different message. He was a World War II veteran, um, and apparently a lot of signalmen from World War II, as fun, figured out ways to do, take two messages at once. And this fellow was very talented at doing that. Um, later on, he went on to uh, go to the French frigate shows. Mom likes to tell that story, but he was gone for a whole year, right about the time I was born. And uh, that was at the French frigate shows, a little island out in the middle of the Pacific. And it had been built during World War II, so that our aircraft would have a place to land and refuel on its way to, to missions in Western, uh, in the Western Pacific. So it's part of the Hawaiian chain. It's now a national <coughs> reserve. Um, there was a wonderful show done. We have a videotape of that where it's a bird reserve now. Um, but he was there for a year. He came back and he served more time uh, in 
on ships out of the Portland area. Then he transferred down to um, Connecticut, where he served at the academy again. And he was the officer in charge of the OCS, which is Officer Candidate School, in New London. And he was in charge and helped, helped organize the move to Virginia. That's why our family moved to Yorktown, Virginia, because they moved the Officer's Candidate School down there. And that's why we lived there for a time. Then he was transferred. We moved out to Hawaii, where we lived there for two years. And he was the captain of the Black Hawk, which was a buoy tender. And the buoy tender went all around the Pacific, and this is now 1960, 63, 62, and it went all around, and the Coast Guard was responsible for all the buoys in the harbors in the Philippines, Tokyo, all of those after the war, they took on responsibility as part of treaties. And so it was his job to go around and make sure the buoys were lined up and they replaced and repaired buoys. Um, the only exciting thing that happened to him that whole trip was at one point, they were in the middle of a zone where the Russians were going to do a uh, nuclear test. And uh, apparently his ship set off an international incident when they couldn't figure out what was this ship doing in there and they thought he was a spy ship. And so there was communications from the State Department to the Coast Guard and finally they got a message that said you need to get out of that area right away. So that was about the only exciting thing that happened when he was there. Uh, he then got, we got transferred to Beverly where he was the Chief of Aids to Navigation in Boston. From there, we went on, he went on to D.C., um, Washington, D.C., and um, what he did there is he was in charge of special services. And he received a commendation medal there because he got to be very effective at um, dealing with uh, distressed families. One of the sad jobs he had is when a military person passed away, he had to talk to the families and arrange services and so forth, and that was what he did under that particular command. Later, he went to Newport, Rhode Island, which is where Jan and I graduated from high school. He went to the War College, Naval War College, taught at the War College. Uh, that's also the same place where he got, received his master's degree from George Washington University and was promoted to captain. So he became captain there. And captain is like a colonel in the Army um, to compare it to that. From there, he, uh, yes, Jen? Well, and what's, what's his degree in? Uh, his degree is in, is in International Affairs from George Washington University. Um, from there, he was transferred down to Washington, D.C., where he became Chief of Congressional Affairs. Um, and if you've ever met my father, you, you would know that that was a perfect gig for him. He was very outgoing, got that from his mother, very gregarious, natural talker, liked to meet new people. And so he basically was the Coast Guard lobbyist for two or three years. His office, he had an office in the Capitol and the office at the Coast Guard headquarters. He spent most of his time at the Capitol when Congress was in session. Um, he made very nice friendships with congressmen um, they got so that they would rely on him for all information regarding the Coast Guard and the Admiral, the Commandant of the Coast Guard would feed him information and then he would go lobby on behalf of the Coast Guard there. Uh, he received an, an additional commendation for that, for that role when he was there. Um, it also happened to be the time where I was there and that's when I received my Eagle rank. And uh, he arranged, he was on the troop committee, and he arranged the whole ceremony. At that time, it was erected. There were five scouts from our troop that got eagle at the same time. And so it was a big deal. Uh, got written into the congressional record. And he arranged for General Hershey uh, to come and be the presenter and the sp spokesman at the ceremony. Uh, General Hershey was at that time the head of the selective service for the military. And that was at the height of the Vietnam War. Vietnam War was just getting to its peak. Uh, he was a very controversial general. Lots of people were picketing his offices. Um, and when he presented me my Eagle Award, and he knew that I was Captain Wood's son, he said, now, son, don't burn this. <laughs> and that was in reference to a lot of people were burning draft cards in the early 70s. Um, from there, he um, was transferred to be Chief of Staff down in Norfolk, Virginia, where he um, was the right-hand man to the Admiral down there in terms of the whole Coast Guard District in the Norfolk area. And it was there that he got his promotion to Rear Admiral, where he then moved back to Washington, where he became the Maritime Policy Advisor to Secretary of Transportation. Um, that was actually an undersecretary level position. So he was considered part of the Secretary's staff. When we visited him, he was in the, he was in the inner circle of the Secretary of Transportation. Um, Aiden, his dad, I remember eating with him in the special dining room with the Secretary's um, hey, it was quite a, quite a privilege, it was quite an honor for him to do that. While he was there, he also um, 
oversaw the Cuyahoga incident investigation, which was an accident involving a Coast Guard ship in the Chesapeake Bay colliding with another ship, and there were casualties. And it was a major investigation, it was a national story at that time, and he headed up that whole uh, review panel. And we have pictures of him on the front page of the Washington Post and so forth. But he says the highlight at that time was meeting a young Diane Sawyer, who was a news reporter in Washington, um, who was very kind to him, but she would, she would listen carefully, but she would always probe him for questions as to what was going on. Later, he became chief of international affairs for the Coast Guard, and in that role, he and my mother got a chance to travel through Europe. Um, that's where he kind of acted as the liaison between the Coast Guard and other countries, and the Coast Guards in other countries, and maritime laws in other countries. And finally, um, he was transferred and took command of the 1st Coast Guard District in Boston, and that is where he served for about a year. And that ran from Eastport to Block Island, basically, and he was charge of all Coast Guard operations for that area. So that is Admiral Ray, or well, Rear Admiral Ray, still. So how many years was he in the Coast Guard? Well, technically it was from 45, 1945, until he retired in 1981. So that would have been, was that 36 years? So 36 years. Is the Coast Guard still under Department of Transportation, or has it been another separate? It's under Homeland Security now. Homeland Security. It's still considered the fifth military.